Happy Mother's Day, TPC. <sighs> just feels good to be in the presence of the Lord, too, doesn't it? Let's just stand with me. Let's just let him know that. Oh, Lord, we're thankful for your blessings today, Jesus. Lord, we give you honor. We give you glory today. Lord, welcome into this house, Lord. Welcome into our hearts and our minds and our spirits, Lord. Change us with your love, Lord. Change us with your grace today, Lord. How we honor you, Lord Jesus, we honor you. I will bless the Lord. Has he done great things for you? Can we just worship him for that? Lord, thank you so much for doing great things in our lives, oh God. Showing up on our behalf, Jesus. We lift you up. We worship you, oh God. We magnify you. We exalt you this morning, Jesus. Thank you for doing it, oh God. We thank you so much. Well, happy Mother's Day, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning to all those that are online. Thanks for carving out some of your time this morning to be with us. God bless you. you. may be seated. Got a number of announcements. If you've had any changes over the past two years, please update the directory in the lobby so we know how to get in uh, contact with you. Friday, May 14th at 7 p.m., there will be a men's rally in Mexico. Please let Pastor Dustin or Brother Scott know if, you're, if you'd like to attend. Also, we're going to have Primrose Hill Teen Challenge with us. We've announced this multiple times. They're going to be sharing some testimonies with us on May 16th in the morning. Come prepared to support them. They're going to have some goods like soaps, lotions, some scrubs. Uh, we just want to show our love and respect for this ministry right here in Randolph County. And on 
May 23rd, Brother Billy Stanley will be preaching on Pentecost Sunday. So we're excited for that. Please bring someone with you to share this wonderful experience. If you want the Pentecostal experience, like Pastor says, come to the Pentecostal church. Fifth Sunday this month, we're going to have service at the park. There's going to be more details coming soon about that as we get closer. Also, our offering designation goes to North American Missions. You know where our offering boxes are. You can always give online. Awesome. And back in the Southeast classroom this morning, there's a backdrop set up for you maybe to take a picture with your mom or your family to get a picture. It's free of charge for your convenience. So please take advantage of that wonderful opportunity to get that photo you've been wanting. So I believe that's all my announcements. I believe Sister Susie's going to come lead us in prayer. God bless you. All righty. This month we are praying about the body and continuing our first focus. Last month was the mind. This month is the body. And our scripture text for this week comes from Romans 6, 12 that says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. We want to set aside anything that would be associated with sin in our body. So that's your prayer focus just to pray about for this week. And then today I have some prayer requests. Isn't it nice to see Sister Nancy Ansel in the house with us this morning? We're so happy to have her here. She's asked if we would pray for um, her leg with a possible fracture in her leg after a fall. So um, just cover her in prayer. I um, want to pray for Vi Cochran, who has cancer. Continue praying for the Crabtree family this morning. I want to pray for Sister Dora to ask the Lord to minister to every need that she has. And Sister Bond, who is still recovering from a fall, ask the Lord to minister to her. Um, and I just wanted to say for those of you who do not have your mother today, I know that can be kind of a difficult thing. And so I'm just praying a special prayer that the Lord would minister to your heart today. And if you are thinking, well, I don't have a mom today or I don't have a good relationship with my mom, I always think every Mother's Day, I think the scripture that tells us that the church is the mother of us all. And so if you need a mom today, you're in the right place. You're in the place that collectively is the mother of us all, that the Lord would just minister to you in a special way this morning. So if you would, let's stand together. If your mom is alive, take a minute and say a special prayer for her, um, that the Lord would minister to her in a special way today. And let's lift all of these needs up to the Lord together. Lord Jesus, we love you. We are so thankful that you minister to us, Lord, as we lift up your name and declare that you are holy, as we declare that you are wonderful and gracious and kind. We're so thankful that you have watched over us and taken care of everything that we have need of. Lord, today you see these needs that we've called before you. For Nancy Ansel and her leg, Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for providing just what she needs. Lord, for Vi Cochran, Lord, for the Crabtree family, you know what Dora needs today and that whole family and for Sister Bond at home, Lord, I thank you for ministering to her and to continue providing healing. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for sending comfort to those whose hearts are hurting today. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have sent the mother of us all, Lord. You have put us into the church, and we are so thankful. Lord, you know all the moms in this place, the things that they carry, the burdens of their heart. I thank you for ministering to them today. Lord, I thank you for providing strength and grace, and we just give you all of the glory. We thank you for your goodness, Lord, in Jesus' name. Isn't the Lord good to us today? You may be seated. Oh, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me But give 
since I found it here, my friends, so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. Oh, he did something that no other friend could do. Just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above. One more time. No one Yes. 
What a day that's going to be. Somebody's excited about heaven in this place. Amen, amen, amen. I'm excited about that place too. It's, it's, it, you lose your, your, your perspective on glory, then you will have nothing but trouble in your mind, trouble in your spirit. And you're going to be saying, I just need another prayer meeting. I just need another prayer meeting. If I could just get in that Holy Ghost high. I'm sorry, my friend. That will not get you through. And the reason I say that is because the old timers grabbed a hold of this. I'm talking about the old timers. Even the apostles grabbed a hold of this reality that if I can get my mind on heavenly things, I can endure whatever this earth throws at me. Because you won't always be riding that high and that happiness wave that you may feel from time to time whenever you, you, you're, you're, you, you know what I'm talking about when you're feeling your Holy Ghost Cheerios? You're not going to always carry that with you, but there has to be something in your mind, some resolve in your spirit that says there is something greater than this that I'm living for, and it's heaven. And if you can ever get a perspective of heaven, it'll get you through. Amen. Amen. You got to have that. That's the goal. That's the inheritance. I, I don't diminish the Holy Ghost one bit, but it is just the earnest. It's the 200 bucks you put down so that you can go to the bank and get your loan process all worked out so that you can come back and then write the big check and own what it is that you put that earnest money down. Do you realize Jesus did that for us on the cross? And when he came back in Pentecost Sunday, which is coming up, we're going to celebrate the fact that we have earnest of what it is that we're going to get the full measure of one day. And that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the house. Yeah, come on. You wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here had it not been for the operation and the gifts of the the wonderful work of a mother. And so I just remind you again after service, if you want to grab a picture with your mother or your family together or something, we have a backdrop and everything uh, inside that far classroom over here as you're exiting out. Just hang a right, in the, and you'll, it's there for, for, your, uh, for your good pleasure. Also, if you're a mother, we have a gift for you. If you haven't already picked one up in the foyer, there are bath and body work lotions there to choose up. You have four to choose from, uh, and so you can pick one of those up before you leave. And thank you, Sister Susie, for reminding us that the church is our mother. And I have to say, my, my, my mother, I give honor to her today. It's very, I'm very blessed to have her with us this, this Mother's Day, and I'm just very thankful for that. My, my mother is one of a kind, and, I, of course, I, have to, I say this all the time, but she is. She's one of a kind, and I, I'm very thankful because my mother wasn't raised in the church. But somewhere along the road of her life, she came in contact with this, and something got a hold of her, and it transformed her life, and she decided, I'm going to connect my kids to this. And I... I Susie, you didn't know this, but I was actually thinking about this on Tuesday this week. And I was thinking about, you know, what the church is, it's the backup to the, to the mother. Because if the mother falls away, you still have the church to come in. Do you think about that in, in regards to that? My mother put her children in the church. She raised her kids in the truth that if one day something would happen to her, there would be this entity, there would be this body that could come in and grab a hold of what was left of the remnant of her family and gather them together and nurture them in the admonition of truth and love for God. That is, it's awesome. And why wouldn't you connect your family to this place? That's the thing. We've got to connect our family to the church because the church is, it, it's, it's what's going to get you there. It's what Jesus is coming for. And you might want to be connected to this. So, amen, amen. All right, we're going to read some ver a verse of Scripture today. And I promise you I won't be very long. I, I'm just going to talk to you today. I'm, I'm not going to eat this microphone at all. And I just, I just, I just want to celebrate moms. 
it's, it's wonderful. My, I give honor to my, my, my mother, but I also give honor to my wife who has borne me three wonderful, beautiful babies and through much pain and through much suffering has endured many hardships to get that, to get those precious ones here. And man, dude, it's a deal. But then you get them out, and then they, they start to grow. After they get out, they just start growing, and and you deal with things. We were talking about this the other day, too, and I, I won't keep you standing. Actually, you could be seated. Why don't you just be seated? You know, it's a good thing I'm actually mindful of that because I could just keep talking and not think about you. That's, that's not right. We were talking about the things that we we have said to each other or things that we have uh, encountered in our, in our married life that post children, you know, you got these kids running around and stuff that you're just like, I never thought I'd say this, or I never thought I'd say, did you ever think this would happen? And, and it's just crazy stuff. And the early on, I mean, just, you, if you're if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. You you never thought in your life you would have so much conversation about bodily functions. <laughs> you know, in regards to your children, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just you're happy. I mean, they're especially in the infant's tile stage. You're just like, I'm calling her up on the phone. You're not gonna believe this. She pooped out of the top of her onesie. I mean, it's like this kind of conversation and you're just like what it's just only kids can bring that into a lot into your life and so but you know none of that is possible the joy that you have with your children and your family and everything that it brings all made possible because of a mom and so I want to read for you a verse of scripture you don't have to stand I just, I'm going to go to Proverbs 31. If you don't know what the Proverbs 31 woman is, you're going to hear about her here in a few verses. And I'm going to read it for you today. Proverbs 31, and I'm starting at chapter, 10, chapter 31, verse 10. And it says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. That's quite a woman. She seeks wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She's a worker. She is like the merchant ships that bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceiveth not that her, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle go, goeth out not by, by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hand to the needy. She's compassionate. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her house are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. In other words, she is royalty. Her husband is known in the gates when he setteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. You know, if you're a mother in this place and you got all the chaos raining around you, you need to grab a hold of that scripture right there. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. It may not be rejoicing right now, but there will be a day of rejoicing. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. She keeps herself busy. Her children arise up, and this is the this is the coup de gras. This is what, why you do what you do, Mom. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. The virtuous woman that I've read to you about in Proverbs 31 is the template for every man. If you're ever going to look for a woman, you need to start looking and memorizing this 
passage of Scripture and measure every potential. If you're a young person you've never been married before, you need to start looking and measure it according to that statute. It is the template of every man, but it is also the challenge for every woman to aspire to. And so today we honor mothers, and I hope to pull a few virtues from a few examples we have in Scripture to encourage us today to be better, to do better. If you're a mother in this place, and you, you may think that maybe you've, you've not made the right choices in, in what you've done with your children, I, I just want to encourage you today that it's never too late to choose. You can choose today to just start doing, doing things better, and every one of us have a choice. And I want to talk to you about that. There's a guy named William William Funk, who is an author of several dictionaries. Now, to be an author of several dictionaries, you've got to be a pretty smart guy. And so he has identified 10 of the most moving words in the English language. Alone is the most bitter word. Death is the most tragic word. Love is the most beautiful word. Revenge is the cruelest word. Tranquil is the most peaceful word. Forgotten is the, war- forgotten is the saddest word. Friendship is the warmest word. No is the coldest word. Faith is the most comforting word. And mother is the most reverent word. I thought that was very fitting. You know, women are amazing creatures of God. They're amazing creations, I should say, of God. And the idea that a woman can bring life into the world is just, it's simply astounding. You know, we we probably don't even give it a second thought, but when you consider it all, that another person comes into this world through her, women are tough. And I know you've heard it said before, but it bears repeating here today that if it was, if childbirth was up to men, the human race would have been wiped out a long, 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 long time ago. Because women have what it takes. Women may not be as strong as men in some ways, but I would have to argue that they possess their own type of strength and are actually in many ways stronger than men. I mean, come on, having a baby, that's no small undertaking. I mean, that pretty well says everything. I, having a baby is a big deal. Babies are, in general, a positive thing. I, I worked for a company called PCA International for about three years, and it was called, PCA stand for Portrait Company of America, and I would travel around sometimes, not all the time, and, and so we would be in uh, Kmart and Walmart and, and different places that we would go and we would set up these studios and people, I called it fast food photography. It's, it's like the $1.99 deal. You get a, you know, a 10 by 13 portrait of your family for $1.99, but then we tried to hook you in and sell you. And it was more about sales than it was photography. And that's, that it drove, drove, drove me crazy because I'm trying to create masterpieces. But it's, it's you, know, you got these babies in there, and that's the thing that I wasn't really expecting. You get all these babies and just babies. I was thrown up on so many times, uh, you know, like this mom's like, here, hold my baby. You know, I'm a stranger. I, I had to learn real quickly. It had to be a real short learning curve for me to handle infants because a mother would just be like, oh, wait, he needs a diaper change. And she was like, here, hold him. And she's grabbing the, the diapers out of the diaper bag and doing all this on the changing table, which is like, a, a, not a changing table, it's a posing table, which is a small thing. And, and I'm holding this baby, and it's throwing up on me and all this stuff. And it's just like you got, you got really connected to people, maybe in ways that you didn't want to be. And so... You've seen people at their best or their worst, you know, and people would take their kids, and their kids would be fussy, you know, and it's like they didn't even bother to give their kid a nap before they went for pictures. And so the kid's already fussy. He's already irritated. And you will sit here, and you will get your picture taken. And, and the kid's like, Wah! and you're just trying to, you know, get him to smile, and it's like an impossible situation. And it's just, if you can imagine. And, and so I didn't feel like I was a baby guy. 
you know, I was good with the scene and try to do the best I can, but it wasn't until I had my own. When I had my own babies, man, I'm a baby guy. And even after that, like post baby for me, like I'm, I just love babies. I love those little little hands and feet and smiles and eyes and just chubby man, full fat things. I love it. I do. I mean, babies babies are are a positive thing. There, there are many things that having a baby does for you, and one of those is that it makes you grow up. I mean, let's talk about that. People think they're grown, but you truly can't grow up until you have something in your life that is more important than you are. I mean, you can think you're grown and all that, but, man, you get something in your life that's a little bit more important than you, and you'll see where... Yeah, that, that grows you up pretty quick. Having a baby teaches you that it's, it's a relief, really, not being the center of attention anymore. It's a relief. The child in your family or uh, the child in, in, in even in a society is immediately the center of attention. And unless you're a narcissist and you have some narcissistic problem in your life and it's all about you, you will allow that to happen. You will allow your children to become the center of attention. And then you learn all sorts of things about yourself. You learn all sorts of things about strangers. I mean, because other people really like babies. And you can be strolling through Walmart and, you know, you've got your car seat all positioned up here and you're protecting this thing that has come to you. And, you know, you're like, just as a dad, you know, I'm thinking, you know, like, Stay away and all this kind of stuff. Especially if you're 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 a first time parent, it's typical. That's what you are. You've got all the the finagling of merchandise that you don't ever need or you will not even use. You know, you go always tell those first time parents because you're like, yeah, this is their first. I mean, you can tell because they got the bottle warmer and all this kind of thing going on, and you're like, yeah. After the second one, you let go. By the third one, you're like, yeah, whatever. We just need. Grab a diaper and, and some formula. We'll be all right. And so uh, you're walking through Walmart, and you got this baby. And, and you may have some, some guy walking towards you that is, he looks like a hardened criminal. He has got, like, he, there's no smile coming on his face. And he's got this scowl that he's looking at you with. And he's walking up, and you're pushing your cart, and you're getting ready to cross over from one section of the aisle to the other because of the way this dude looks. But then he looks at your baby, and all of a sudden, it's like this smile forms and the layers come off, and it's just this response to the innocence that is sitting there in that car seat. He's smiling not at you, but at the baby. And it's just like the, the babies are a positive thing, and it's just really cool that, that you could see that rough character. I mean, they, they, you wouldn't expect them to do that, but he's smiling at this baby. And weird enough, whenever you have kids, especially newborns, you discover that babies are some sort of public property. Have you, have, you know, I mean, you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Like people come up and they start touching your property. They're messing with your property. And, it's, and, and even, even before you have the baby, some of you ladies can testify to this if you've ever been pregnant before. Somehow a pregnant woman becomes public property. Because people just want to come up. They're excited about what's about to happen. They're, they're touching your belly. You, wouldn't you just wouldn't walk up to a random woman and who's not pregnant and touch her belly. But for some reason, it's okay to do it to a complete stranger if she's pregnant. And so it's not, just by the way, just to let you know. But as a general rule, when you leave this place, don't, don't touch other people that don't invite you to do that. But there's something about babies. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? There's something about motherhood. There's something about this whole picture that draws people into it. Mothers make the difference, and we, we honor mothers today. And every one of us who are alive came from a mother. And so the Word of God uses mothers to teach us about how we ought to be as parents and how faith in God should always play the role as a center of our choices in regarding our families and so I've talked to you 
a couple of weeks ago about Samson and how he wanted to be just like everybody else, but he couldn't because he was called and he was called apart to be separate unto God. And the part of that message that I left out was that his great calling and everything that Samson was, which gave birth to his great strength, began with his mother. Everything began with his mother. In Judges chapter 13, verse 1 it starts out, and, and this is pretty typical. If you read the book of Judges, you'll read this statement, and it starts like this. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. You'll find that phrase all throughout the book of Judges. These, these people, man, no wonder God was frustrated. And, and, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. In other words, she couldn't have babies. We knew she was barren because she was married, and they had been trying to have kids. And so Manoah, her, she remains nameless, but it gives us his name. So she's the wife of this guy named Manoah. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, beware. I pray thee, and drink. It's talking to her specifically. Drink not wine or strong drink or eat anything that is unclean. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. And for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Well, many of us know the story of Samson, the strongest man in Scripture. And I believe he wasn't that big of a guy because I mean, he, in my mind, I picture him, not as Hollywood portray him, but I just think of him as an average dude. That's what made him so unique. I don't think he was this, this you know, stone-cold Steve Austin guy kind of walking around, just this burly dude. He was just this, this guy who looked average, but upon him would come the Spirit of the Lord and supernatural, heroic Marvel character strength would come upon him, and he would do some great stuff. And so the Bible tells me that God enjoys taking the weak things of the world to shame that which is strong. So in my mind, I'm like, he's just an average guy because God's not going to give to him the brawn. And then people would say, well, it's because of his muscles that he was able to do that. No, God doesn't work in that. That's not the way God's economy works. God chooses from the bottom of the pile and from the back of the line, and that's what he uses. And so God always brought things about from the most unlikely places. You see it all throughout Scripture. Gideon the least in Israel. David, a lowly little shepherd boy who became a king. Uh, Moses, who had a speech impediment, began, began the, became the leader of an entire nation, or, or a bunch of fishermen for that matter, on the shore of Galilee. God chose that. I mean, it's just God does these things. And so God likes to get the glory out of impossibility because for us it's the reminder that with God, all things are possible. And that's the way he works. And so because I spoke about Samson a couple weeks ago, I'm not going to take time to describe the details of Samson's life and how he displayed these great feats of strength and, and, and broke literally broke the back of the Philistines. But rather, I want to talk to you this morning on how the story of this dynamic character and maybe a couple others, if we can get to them in time in Scripture, how they, they, it all began with a decision or a choice from the mother. It was the mother that was the one, the catalyst, really, to set everything into motion. Had not the mother done what she did, what we would read about and what we would celebrate as a character in Scripture that was a deliverer or a savior or whatever have you, it all began with what mama chose to do with herself. What you choose as a mother matters. What you choose as a mother matters. What you choose to do and not do matters. And when I say not do, I don't mean as a mother you chose not to participate in the wrong things, but I also mean that you can choose to simply do nothing, and that was your choice. It was your parenting strategy. And something, sometimes a denied nothing is just as bad as an intentional something. In the story of Samson, the angel of the Lord appears to Manoah's wife and tells her that her barren womb is going to produce this child, and it always seems that God is always speaking to barren women. 
but not necessarily barren, barren women, or at least he speaks to women prior to pregnancy. It's, it, you, you find this throughout Scripture. Samson's mother is, is obviously, she's nameless. She's just referred to as Manoah's wife. And she is told that her son Samson will bring deliverance to the oppressed people of Israel in this nation. But there was a catch, however. In order for this to happen, the child must be a Nazarite from the womb. So, in other words, in order for him to participate in the vow that he needs in his life, it's first got to begin with you, Mom. You're the one that's going to have to start this process. Now, the Nazarite vow was a special way of setting one, someone apart. It was a way of consecrating someone unto God by setting them apart to the service of the Lord. It was an act of submission. It was an act of consecration unto God. And so the Nazarite vow consisted, consisted of three things. No razor is going to touch your head or your hair had to be uncut. And it, and it also involved that you would not touch any deadly, uh, dead thing or defile yourself, and that you couldn't uh, drink of anything of the vine, so no wine. And most often this vow was taken after the child was born or, or he was weaned from his mother, and then he had to be taken to the priest, and, and there's this whole regiment that had to happen in order for someone to participate in the Nazarite vow. But here we find a mother who has been given a challenge to first have faith, as she was going to actually, number one, have a baby, and number two, that the child would be a Nazarite from its beginning. And so Manoah's wife was barren and, and was willing to listen and believe what the voice of the Lord was telling her to do. The truth is strong, tr strong children begin with a strong mother. Strong children come from strong mothers. And whenever a mother decides to obey the voice of God in her life, she can produce something out of that that is greater perhaps than herself. And that it really should be the prayer of every parent, that your children will do better than you did, to be better than you are, to do go further than what you've done. And I'm not just talking about in their careers. I'm talking even in faith that your children will do more for the kingdom of God than what you've done. Does anybody feel that this morning, that you feel like that's a desire? Every parent wants more for their kids. I want my kids to be more and to do more and have more and all of that. I want that. And so in order for that to happen, happen and has to first begin with us. And I think about, again, my mother adopting the faith in her life and, and choosing to raise her kids in the church and, and that what she has done. And, and she would have never, never dreamed in a million years that I would be pastoring this church. That was never on her radar. It wasn't even on my radar. But God has a way of honoring faith. He honors actions. He honors faithfulness. If there's anything that God keeps track of most, it is faithfulness. You need to get that down in your crawl because that's going to help you one of these days. I was thinking about it last night. I was visiting Sister Dora, and we were talking after we left, my wife and I, how Dora Gibson has been a faithful woman of God. God has has novels written on the faithfulness of Dora Gibson in the annals of, of eternity right now because of what she has done with her life. Her faithfulness is a testament to not just this congregation, but to her family and everybody else that was connected to her in this community. They knew who she was. They know who she is. And so they, they recognize there's something about her that is faithful. And so faithfulness, God honors. And if we will act in obedience and faith, God can take that, and he can build off of that. So this is really for every mother and perhaps even every potential mother in the house. If you're willing to be led of the Lord, his spirit will guide you. It will instruct you in what you need to do for yourself first before you can reproduce it in your family. And I believe God can lead us. In that direction. I'm not talking about physically. God can give us strong children because of strong women, but I'm not talking of physical sense, but I'm really talking about spiritually strong children who will be full of faith and they themselves will be led of the Spirit. It all begins with Mama. 
It begins with mom. If, if a mother can grab a hold of, of the truth, if she can in faith reach out and get a hold of God and then somehow never let go of her experience with God and be faithful to the house of God and be faithful to the word of God and show and teach her kids through the instruction and discipline of her own personal walk with God, live it out in front of your kids, one day it's going to pay off. Samson's mother made a decision to sanctify herself for the sake of her child. And because a single mother decided to say yes to the commitment and consecration that God was requiring of her, it changed the fate of an entire nation. Think about that. One mother chose to say yes. She made the choice. It was hers to make, and she made a choice. We hear all that even that rhetoric still around today. I can't believe we're still having this discussion of pro-choice. I'm not going to go down that road because you know where I stand on all that. All life begins with God. It's not up to you. But the fact is, is that every mother does have a choice, not as in to whether or not they can execute their, their, their baby in their womb. They have a choice as to whether or not I can live by faith and I can obey God's word and I can give this baby a better foundation than what I had whenever I started. It's up to you. The miracle of Samson started with a choice from his mother, not just a set, not just to set her, her, her son's life apart as a Nazarite, but also to set herself apart as well. In the book of Exodus, we see the mother of Moses. Now, the father, this is the kind of flip of the script. The father is not named of Moses, but the mother is. Her name is Jochebed. And she sets her son free so that he may live. This is the, there, there's something there in that, that she's, she's, she's putting her son, in, and most of us know the story of Moses where she, the king of Egypt has decreed that every male of a certain age would of the slaves of of the Jews or the Hebrews that is they would be executed and so they would be thrown into the Nile River and they would be fed to the crocodiles and so as terrible as that was Jochebed decided that she would put her baby in a in, in a little basket an ark if you will that she made for her son and she put him into the bulrushes of the Nile River and and, and told her daughter to to watch over her her baby brother and that she would watch and make sure that this nothing happened to him. And so as it as it pans out, according to God's perfect instruction and timing, the baby ends up in the hands of the daughter of the man who decreed that baby's death to begin with. It's like this whole irony, but God has a way of of doing that. And so it's amazing to watch how everything kind of works out. And so Jochebed ends up, uh, I mean, it's like, it's like perfect timing. I mean, the, the Pharaoh's daughter finds this little Hebrew baby. She's, oh, look at this little slave baby here. And she picks it up and she has compassion on this baby because, again, everybody likes babies. And so she's picking up this baby and she's she's loving on this baby and she chooses that I will adopt this baby. And and just, it, it just like perfect timing, here comes Mary. Miriam stepping out of the bushes, and she says, hey, do you need a Hebrew nurse for that baby? And she says, well, yes, I do. Well, let me go find you one for her, and goes back and gets Moses' mother, his very own mother, to come in and to nurse him. I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. She gets to save her son's life and nurse him at the same time. And so the Bible says that Pharaoh's daughter gave him the name Moses. She named him. Egypt named Moses. But there was something in Jochebed that was nursing him. Other people can try to name you, but it's what nursed you. That's what matters most. And you think about Jochebed, what she did every day at home with that baby, what she did every day with Moses. That's what matters. It's the nurturing, the everyday nurturing that a mother does, the lifestyle that you live before your family, the conversation you have with your children, the way you are with your spouse, the way, the way you are with your kids, what you do every day at home, what you are with your children every single day is the nurturing that will bring them to where they need to be. 
and we see that even in the life of Moses, that eventually, yeah, he became a prince of Egypt, but eventually his nurturing grabbed a hold of him. It kicked in at some point and drew him back to the roots of where he came from. And if you're a mother in this place who has nurtured your children in the admonition and the knowledge of God, and your kids aren't living for the Lord today. I say to you this morning, you grab a hold of the story of Jochebed and think about that, that I've nurtured them in truth, and they aren't here today. But, yeah, they're out in Egypt, and they're doing that thing in the world. But I'm here to tell you today there's an encouraging word for you, that the nurturing that you gave to them will kick in in due time, and God will bring them back to his people. There's so many women in Scripture. I'm not going to be able to get to all these today. Look at Hannah. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they, they had had something to drink. And Eli was a priest, and he sat at the, in the gate of the temple of the Lord. And go, go to verse 10. And, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She was so grieved. And she vowed a vow. This is the cool thing. He said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will Give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. There we go. He's a Nazarite again. Samson Nazarite. Samuel is promised to be a Nazarite as well. Hannah is broken. She wants a baby so bad in her life. She feels like there, and here God honors her prayer. There's something about her. I'm, I'm In my mind, I picture Hannah that day in the temple praying unto the Lord, just weeping. And the Bible says she wept sore. Have you ever cried so much that your eyes hurt? That's where she was. She cried so much that she w- her eyes were hurting. And, that, that, and finally, Eli, the priest, comes by and says, Woman, are you drunk? Because the Bible says she just got to this point where she was just praying and she was not saying anything. She, she was just mouthing the words of her prayer. And then finally, Eli comes up to her and accuses her of her being drunk. She's like, Lord, I'm not drunk. I'm just, I'm just I have this desire. I want a baby. I want something that I can invest in. I want something that, and so Eli says, well, the Lord grant you whatever it is that you're asking him for. And goes on, but does not understand. There's something about when people pray. Luke chapter 1 verse 26 tells us uh, about about Mary, and and I'm going to get to her in a minute, but there's something about the availing nature of prayer. The Bible says that the prayer of a righteous person does what? It availeth much. It, it goes, there's something about when righteous people pray and God hears you. But the Bible makes the distinction between those that pray and those that are righteous and they pray. It availeth much. In other words, there's something that gives it a little bit more weight with God whenever you're living right and you ask God for some things. And so that's where Hannah was. She was living, she was, she was living right. She was a she was a man of God's wife. She was she was she was in this place where she just wanted something from God and she wanted this baby. And so God finally honors her request and gives her Samuel. And Samuel becomes the greatest prophet and greatest priest that the nation of Israel had ever known. He was the man. I mean, Samuel, from a young, young, young tyke that all the way through, he, he grew in wisdom and stature with God. And so God honored the prayer of Hannah. And I just want to encourage a mother in this place. If you're praying and you know you're living right and you're doing whatever you can to live for the Lord, I want to tell you that your prayers for your family, they avail. You are the availer of your family. And if you, don't, if you don't think of yourself in any other way, you need to think of yourself that way. That whenever I'm praying for specific needs in my kids or in my husband's life or whatever it is that your family dynamic looks like, whenever you pray and you are living for the Lord and you're doing whatever you need to do to be submitted to God and his authority and his word, there's something about when you pray, it avails with God and it goes further than you think it does. You look at Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. (laughs) I'm not going to read all the way through that. But basically in Luke chapter 1, 
the angel of the Lord appears unto Mary, and Mary's, Mary's awestruck. I mean, you can imagine an angel shows himself in front of you and tells you, hey, I know you haven't, you're not married yet, and, uh, and you're getting ready to get married, but we just want to let you know that God has a plan for you, and that plan is to, you know, you're going you're gonna to be pregnant, and you're going to have this baby. And of course, her question is, she's logical. This is the thing I love about Mary. She's logical. How can, it, how can that be since I've never been with a man? And you go, well, the Holy Ghost is going to do this. And so she's, she basically says, let it be according to thy will. Let it be. I'm your handmaiden. Let it be. It was a sign of total surrender to the will of God. And I, I was just thinking about this, and I was thinking about Mary, and I was thinking about what, because she knew what would happen to that baby. She knew that Jesus would, he would grow, and he would, he would eventually be sacrificed. I mean, the Bible even says she pondered these things in her heart. She, she had to get her mind around the fact that there's going to be a day in which my son is going to be sacrificed. He's going to be tortured. He's going to be beaten. He's going to he, all of this is going to befall him, and I'm going to bring him into the world anyway. I mean, think about that. You ever heard? I've I've had these conversations with people, or I've heard somebody say that I just don't want to have kids because I don't want to bring them into this terrible world. I'm like, that's, that's too bad because you don't know what you're missing. I think when it comes to a mother, because maybe at some point every mother wrestles with this, that, I, you, that you're going to go forward with having a baby. You're going you're gonna to actively pursue bringing a child into the world. Like you have to get your head around that that it's going to be here, and then when it gets here, it's going to be subjected to all this stuff. I think when, and sorry, I'm just, I'm just kind of digressing here, that you, you have to get your head around that in some way, and that's where Mary was. She had to choose. Although all this stuff is going to happen, I'm going to, I'm going to still allow that to happen because at some point, I've got to teach this child that although there is malevolence and tragedy in this world and you're going to have trials and tribulations and hurt and pain and everything else that comes along with just living life, there is something called faith in God that helps you supersede all the, tr all the tragedy of what life is. And that somehow all the suffering that you endure in your life can be justified by simply living for the Lord. And, and that you, are, you don't give up on everything because, because of the suffering. You don't give up on, on people because people are, are what people are. But there's hope. And that impartation of hope is something that I think that a woman actually actually embraces, and it is the most noblest of things that could ever be done whenever a woman decides that, hey, I am going to go forward. I'm going to pursue having a child and bringing a child into the world because child, children are a positive thing. Children are a great thing. They are a gift of God. So we see Mary in this total surrender unto the Lord, knowing what was going to happen, but she did it anyway because she was willing to take what she knew was right to do. She was willing to do what was right. And so you have all these different women in Scripture. You have Eve. You have Rebecca. You have Abigail and Jael and Veronica and the widow of Sidon and, and Eunice and Lois that, that Paul's alluding to with Timothy saying, hey, you know, the, the, the faith of the, your mother and grandmother. The, I mean, it's just all these women in Scripture that show us that you can choose to have faith and that faith makes the difference in the long run and even in the short term. Faith makes the difference. All these women are notable in Scripture for one reason or another, but mainly it was their faith being lived out in front of their children every single day. And that's what makes the difference. If you're a mother in this place this morning, 
Choosing to live your faith in front of your children is one of the greatest gifts that you can give your kids. Because whenever you do that, you're investing in your kids. And investing in others is the best investment that you can do in this world because it's going to live on. As I said before, my mother wasn't raised in the truth, but one day she decided that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And it changed the course of our family. It changed the course. There was a choice at some point. My grandfather was an alcoholic. But at some point, she had to choose. This is going to be different for me. It's going to be different for my family. It's going to be different for my children. The house you grew in, grew up in is what you consider normal most of the time. I mean, if you, if you have enough forethought to understand your house was not normal, then the Lord bless you. That's a gift of God. But for most people, normal is the house you grew up in. But at some point, and I tell this to couples whenever they're coming to me for marriage counseling, what you choose to do with your marriage right here, you could choose to go in, in a completely different direction than your family. You don't have to be them. You don't have to do life like they did. You, it's you and your spouse versus the world. And there's nothing that they could do to stop you. You can make that choice. And so even as a mother here today, and I want us to all stand if you would. As a mother here today, you have a choice set before you to do things differently. And, and, and if you've raised your kids in the truth and you, you've tried to instill faith in your, in your children then, then more power to you and just continue doing what you're doing. But if, if you're a mother in this place and you feel like, man, man maybe I, I, I've fallen short along the way or there's something that I've done that maybe wasn't right, you can make an amends with your children and you can tell yourself and tell, tell God that I'm going to commit myself to you, Lord, in, in a deeper way than what I have in times past. And what you choose to do in yourself today I promise you will be magnified in your children at some point. I heard it said this, said it this way by Pastor McGarvey. He used to always say this. What you choose to do in moderation, your children will do in excess. That's such a profound thought to think about. If I want to live, if I want to live life for me and do what I want to do and have disregard for anybody else or I don't, even, I don't even want to live according to God's word. I don't even want to put this into my family. Then your children will do that in excess. But if I could somehow get this ingrained into my family and that this becomes the cornerstone of why we do what we do, then there's a chance that my children will do it better than me. They'll be better than me. I want to pray a special blessing over our mothers today. If your mother's here, I invite you to get close to her. If she is not, maybe your mother's passed on. I want to encourage you today that you can be a mother to somebody. Perhaps you don't have children of your own, and maybe you're a stepmother. The, the fact is this, whether biological or, or sociological, physiological, Whatever capacity, whatever jurisdiction of motherhood you have, I want to pray over you because you have influence. And as a mother, what you do matters. Lord Jesus, I pray over our mothers. Because, Lord, there's some choices that need to be made in this place. There's some Hannahs in this room. There's some Jacobeds in this place that have nurtured. And they're waiting on those sons to come knocking again. They're waiting on those babies to come full circle. Lord, there's some Marys in this place and have surrendered to what it is that your will is for their lives. Lord, there's some, some mothers, Lord, that are going to commit themselves first so that they can see it.
born into their children later? Or is there an impartation in this place, God, that you want to give to our mothers? God, I ask that you give it this morning. Lord, that there would be faith that rises up. There would be a boldness in our, in our mothers, Lord, that there would be a Proverbs 31 that rises up inside of the hearts and the minds of our mothers here today. Lord, if we need anything, we need strong women. We need bold women. We need women who are not afraid. We need women who are willing to stand for their faith. We need women who are willing to speak the truth in love. I pray, God, over our ladies today that you would give to them, Lord, everything that they need. I pray an impartation of your spirit through the power of the Holy Ghost, Lord, that it would grab a hold of them and lead them as they lead their families. It would guide them as they guide their children, as they guide their grandchildren, grab a hold of some of these grandmothers in this room, Lord, that have big grandbabies and great grandbabies. Lord, that there would be an impartation that comes from them to that generation. Lord, that they can impart faith. They can impart it through love and compassion. Lord, they could speak truth. And Lord, I pray for our mothers, Lord, that their words would not fall to the ground. But Lord, that their counsel would be heard as wisdom. Lord, that it would be received as such. Give them words beyond their humanity to speak specifically into crisis, specifically into circumstances that will arise in their family. I pray, Lord, that you would help them. You would undergird them with strength and grace and truth and love. Lord, that they would walk all the days of their life, that they would trust you. As, Lord, you lead them, they lead others. Help us, Jesus, to grab a hold of the, of the truth. Help us grab a hold of your word. Let your word be the cornerstone. Let it be the foundation of our families. And we thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to encourage you on this Mother's Day, if, you, if your mother's not here or if you're in some way able to celebrate your mother with somebody, please do that. Every one of us need, need mothers. And again, to our ladies, you have nothing but my respect. We, we need strong women of faith. And I believe that this church is full of strong women of faith. And it's those strong women that are in our congregations that are going to help transform. As you think about that, Manoah's wife was one woman who chose to be obedient to God's voice in her life and consecrate herself first so that her son would be consecrated unto the Lord and he set the nation free. That's the power that one woman has. How much more power do we have represented in this place today? The power of two or three, four, five, six, binding together. I believe that if our ladies will get together and pray, they could shake the foundations of hell itself. There's a power that is with you. Women, I, I, I know men have, have their thing, but man, there's something about when women get to, together and pray. I'm, my wife talks about ladies' conferences that she's been a part of. And some of you ladies have been there. You know the power of what happens when a bunch of ladies get together. You are the movers and you are the shakers. It's true. Is the man the head of the house? Yes. But you are the neck that turns the head in whatever direction it needs to go. I love you. Thank you. God bless you on this Mother's Day. We thank you for being here.